I'm grateful. I am grateful to serve a church that values the ongoing education of its pastors. I'm grateful to each one of you, whether you know it or not, <laughs> for the ways that you support the two of us taking time away to rest and to learn. It's part of our agreement, our our contract, if you will, to, to take time away to have that provided for us. And so I'm so grateful. And I was able to take advantage of that opportunity this week. And I wanted to take time today to share some of what I learned. Pastor Veronica and I spent the first part of this week in Kansas City. We were invited to be part of a cohort program that's part of the American Baptist Churches, one of our two denominations. And this program is focusing on innovative models of ministry. This program will last at least this year, if, if not another after that. And this was the kickoff in-person event. We got to meet our fellow clergy people, some from this area, others from New York and New Jersey and Washington State. We talked with community organizers and denominational leaders, and we visited different sites in Kansas City of innovative ministry. And the conversations we had together as a cohort, they are so important. And as we were having them, I kept thinking to myself, yes, yes, we need to be talking about this among clergy, but it can't stay there. We also need to have these conversations in church, in our church. This cohort model was developed out of an important recognition. The recognition that the future of the church is uncertain. It's no secret. We've read the articles. We've, we've talked about it ourselves. Christianity is declining in the United States. Congregations are smaller than they once were. Churches are closing. And many more will close over the next five years. So maybe the first thing that comes to our minds is why? Why is this happening? There's no singular answer, but I believe that a primary reason is that the church has been harmful. Big C church, the church at large, has been harmful. People have been shamed, hated, and diminished in the name of God. People don't want to be involved in the church because they see Christians behaving badly and hypocritically. Here's a pretty relevant example. The Bible in the book of Leviticus says, The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the stranger as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That's what the Holy Scripture says. Yet, 
There are Christians today who not only see strangers, migrants, refugees as less than, but actively refuse their needs, and even are currently using that group as a political stunt. People see this. People see it happening, and they see Christians being part of it. They see Christians behaving in what they perceive as hypocritical, judgmental, and downright abusive ways, and of course they don't want to be a part of that. I, I sometimes look around and I'm like, that's not the Christianity I want to be a part of. So I think that's one reason. Another reason is the COVID pandemic. The shelter in place broke the habit of regular Sunday church attendance. I'm not judging here. I get it. And many haven't returned. And they haven't returned, I think, because they haven't missed it. Many found that church just wasn't a meaningful part of their lives. And so they filled their Sunday mornings with something that is. And a third related reason is that church practices don't always resonate with contemporary life. Again, not a value judgment. This just is. Sometimes people walk into a church and they don't see themselves reflected. They don't hear or experience anything that matches with what they're going through, with their day-to-day -day experience. And so the church at large faces a choice. And this isn't the first time the church at large has faced a choice. So when I think about this, I, I, I try not to be too scared or, or wonder if I'm going to have a job in 20 years. I say, oh, the church has faced choices like this before. If you look at church history, it's filled with the church needing to make some important choices. And the choice now is similar. Change, connect, innovate, or continue to decline. These are conversations that are being had at the denominational level of every mainline church group in the country. I cannot tell you the number of emails that I get on a weekly basis for conversations and conferences and gatherings to talk about this exactly. Change, connect, innovate, or continue to decline. Now, some churches will choose to stay as they are, and that's okay. I've said it before today, it's not a value judgment. There's a lot of dignity to be found in a good end. I have seen, I have loved dearly churches that have consciously decided to remain the same, to keep doing what they're doing until their doors have to close. There's dignity to be found in that choice. But what of those that try to change? If anyone has ever tried to change something in their lives, you know it's, it's harder than it looks. Especially at church, right? Our churches are imbued with so much memory, so much meaning that even the smallest change can incite anxiety and pain. Let me tell you a story. The church I grew up in had this tradition of decorating the sanctuary on the first Sunday of Advent. We called it the hanging of the green. And everyone would come out on Sunday night, and we would sing carols and literally deck the halls of the church. Now, the best part of this service was decorating the two Christmas trees that were on either side of the, the front pulpit area. And all of the kids would race from the back of the church, where you could collect the ornaments, to the front of the church where the Christmas trees were. And I literally mean race, because you wanted to get your hands on as many ornaments and hang as many ornaments as you possibly could. I could have medaled, won an Olympic level medal in how fast I ran down the aisles of the church. And I, and I don't run. I didn't run in any other capacity, but hanging of the green, ooh, 
I was fast. And I remember those ornaments so well. There were these clay angels and golden harps. And my favorite were these crystal grape clusters. And so I knew how it hanged on the tree and, and how it sparkled in the light. But when I was in middle school, the church decided to change the decorations. Completely new ornaments were made, all of which depicted chrismons or specific symbols of the Christian faith. I hated them. I hated them. I didn't want crosses or chiros or needlepoint ichthus. I wanted crystal grapes with gold filigreed leaves. Was that too much to ask? I literally cried over this change. And that might sound silly, I know. And honestly now, as an adult and as an ordained person, I understand why they changed the ornaments. But how many of us have felt something similar? The social hall is redecorated. The pulpit is replaced. The music style shifts. That's a big one. It's hard to change. Even when there's good reasons for doing so. Even when we want a change to happen. It's hard. Isaiah 55, 10 through 13 addresses the anxiety and the pain that comes with making change. This was the centering text for our cohort gathering for precisely this reason. Isaiah speaks into the anxiety that arises in change. I want us to, to do something this morning. I want us to read it together. Turn to your scripture. And let's read verses 10 and 11, just 10 and 11 first, out loud. <laughs> For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word has a purpose. God's word is spoken for a reason. And Isaiah isn't just talking about scripture. This text is pre-canonical. That means it was written and existed long before we ever had this thing we call the Bible. So Isaiah isn't just talking about the Bible because the Bible didn't yet exist. He's talking about all forms of God's word. The word that comes through scripture, the word that comes through prayer, the word that comes through service, the word that comes through that inner divine wisdom. God's expansive word has a purpose, just like rain and snow. Its purpose is to nourish us so that we might grow, to nourish our souls. And God asks us in this scripture to trust that her word will accomplish its goal. To trust that the word will not come back empty. Isaiah is talking to a people coming out of exile. They've had years, years, decades of what looked like failure. Years of waiting, years of defeat. They might have said, looks empty to me. Just as we, the large church, might now say, it sure looks like God's word is coming back empty. Churches are closing. Christianity is declining. Christian nationalism is rising. This can't possibly be success. But here's the thing. Success may not come in the time that we expect it to. And success may not come in the form that we expect or, quite frankly, the form that we want. 
But God's word has a purpose. And we have to trust that it won't come back empty. Jesus had something to say about trust. Jesus is in Galilee when he encounters two blind men. These men have sought him out. They have pursued him throughout the town because they've heard about his miraculous healings in the community. So they call out to him, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus meets them and he asks them a question. And I think it's so interesting what he asks. He doesn't ask where they're from. He doesn't ask about their condition. He doesn't ask them for money or proof of insurance. He just asks, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord. And Jesus touches their eyes. According to your faith, let it be done to you. Jesus asks questions like this throughout the gospel. Do you have faith? Do you believe? Do you trust that a change can happen in your life? And I think that the same question is before us today. Do you believe that a change can happen in your life? Do we believe that change can happen in our midst? Do we believe that God's word still has a purpose in our lives and our context and will not return to God empty? I don't know what will happen if the answer is no. I don't. And honestly, God can still do some pretty good work with a no. But if the answer is yes... Yes, we trust. Yes, we believe. Yes, we have even the smallest little mustard seed of faith. Then listen to the promise of Isaiah 55. Let's finish this scripture together. Will you read out loud with me verses 12 and 13? For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is God's blessing, a blessing that was spoken after exile, spoken to people who have known thorns and have known briars. God promises new growth. God promises joy and peace. God promises that if we trust, if we maybe make a little room, that cypress and myrtle will sprout up before our eyes. Do you believe that God is able to do this? We're entering what to me honestly feels like our first real program year since the start of the pandemic. I mean, we've had program years, but this to me like, feels like the first real one. And we've spent three years responding in the moment to crisis after crisis. It's what we had to do. And do you realize that's been three-fourths of our time here as pastors? Three-fourths of our time all together. And I'll be honest, there's been moments, and I don't think I'm the only one, where that's felt like exile. Where I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired and I'm weary and this is so hard. This is a pivotal moment in the life of this church. We're making serious decisions about our building, our finances, our organizational structure. Just next week, we're going to hear the board's recommendation for a new ministry model of how we all participate in the life of this church. We're being challenged to change something. And we're being asked to trust. So again, the question my friends, this morning is, do we believe that God is able to do this? 
Do we believe that God's word has a purpose in our lives, together and in our lives individually? Do we trust that if we change, new things can grow? I believe that. I do. I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't. And I believe it even when sometimes it's hard because Christ healed the blind. If Christ can heal the blind, what else can God do? And I believe it because Christ got up from the tomb. And if Christ can do that, what else can God do? And I believe it because Christ promised that new life is possible. And if God can do that, if God is for that, what else is possible? Amen.